three friends were discussing death one day, and one of them said, you know, what would you like somebody to say at your funeral about you? And the three men thought a little bit, and one man said, I think I'd like them to say I was a humanitarian because I cared about my community. The second one said, I want to be known as a good husband and father and be a good example to people. And the third one said, look, he's moving. <laughs> Death isn't a laughing matter, but Lazarus was actively dying when his family sent for Jesus, the only person who could change the situation, but the doctor was delayed on purpose. In scene one of the story, Jesus appears to be indifferent. When Jesus got the message about Lazarus, he was only two miles away in Beth from Bethany. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were Jesus' best friends. You'd think he'd rush right over. Instead, he waited two days until Lazarus was, in fact, dead. He gave some excuse about doing it so you'd see the glory of God. Mary and Martha probably felt like saying, Jesus, this wasn't about you. It was about Lazarus. They had a right to be upset. Not only did Jesus wait two days, but he waited two more days on his way to Bethany, two miles. And he was probably healing people on the way. Scene two shows a different side of Jesus. Martha and Mary went out to meet Jesus and reprimand him for taking too long. Seeing Mary and the Jews who came with her weeping, Jesus was moved. In fact, he was moved to tears. The mourners took note and said, look how Jesus loved him. Someone who is indifferent to our crisis doesn't cry with us. Jesus showed deep compassion for his friends. And then scene three. You know this part of the story. Jesus asked that the stone be rolled away from the front of the tomb, and the crowd protested, Jesus, he's been dead for four days, and his decaying body will stink. Maybe they also thought, why disturb the tomb just so Jesus can have a look-see? Again, Jesus said something about seeing the glory of God. The tomb was opened. And Jesus prayed, Father, I know you always hear me, but I say this for the crowd so they will believe you sent me. And Jesus' voice must, must have echoed through the tombs when he said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus stood up, and Jesus ordered them to unbind his grave clothes and let him go free. Luke ends the story by saying, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Jesus demonstrated his power to restore life to the glory of God. Just because Jesus is our friend doesn't mean we don't get our heart broken. When our life goes sour, when our world is turned upside down, when the unthinkable happens, we may judge God as being indifferent. God could have changed the outcome, we think. Therefore, God doesn't care about us. We're not important enough to God to take away this pain. And so, when God seems to turn away from them, that some people will turn away from God. I was with Claudette in the emergency room for a while this week. And if you've ever been in the emergency room, you know the name of the game is wait. You, if you aren't deemed in crisis, you have to wait to see the doctor. If you go, need to go to the bathroom, you wait for somebody to come and untangle you from all the cords. If you're coughing and need a drink, you wait for the attention of the nurse. It's hard to wait when you feel your problem is an emergency. So the most troubling part of this story for Lazarus' friends is that Jesus waited. 
Jesus could have been there to heal, heal Lazarus and spare his family and friends from death, from the pain of death. It was so out of character for this man who would stop to heal a hemorrhaging woman or stoop to comfort a sick child or make a blind man see. Why did Jesus wait? Cori Ted Boom is well known for her book, The Hiding Place, about the underground tragedies and the movement to protect the Jews during World War II. When Cori was a little girl in Holland, her first realization of death came when she vis visited a friend of a neighbor who had died. It impressed her that sometime her parents would die. Cori's father comforted her with the words of wisdom. Cory, when I take you to Amsterdam, when, did I get, when do I give you the ticket? Well, just before we get on the train, said Cory. Exactly, her father said, our wise family in heaven, father in heaven, knows when we're going to need things. Don't run out ahead of him, God, uh, Cory. When the time comes that some of us will have to die, you will look in your heart and find the strength you need just in time. There's a blooper from the Indiana Department of Social Services. This letter appeared in national news that there was a deceased person who got this letter. Your food stamps will be stopped in March because we received notice that you passed away. May God bless you. You may reapply if there's a change in your circumstances. <laughs> And unless your name is Lazarus, there aren't too many who would have seen a change of circumstances. We experience resurrection in different ways. In our own valley of the shadow of death, we may experience God as indifferent or crying with us or as a source of new life. It's our choice. Hopefully, just in time, we will grasp the new life God offers King Duncan says, for some of us, new life may be a chance to start over with our lives. For others of us, new life may mean new energy to deal with burdens we already carry. The main thing is that new life is available, and it's a wonderful thing. Brett Blair and James Moore identify three aspects of the Lazarus story that still happen. Jesus cried with those he loved, and still does. You've heard the story of the little boy whose neighbor's wife died. The boy walked over to the neighbor and sat on his lap, and later his mother asked, what did you say to the man? Nothing, said the little boy. I just cried with him. Jesus raised people up and still does. Resurrections will happen. God can free us from any tomb that entraps us and gives us a fresh start, a new chance. Jesus involved other people in the healing process and still does. When Lazarus stood up, his, Jesus told his friends, unbind him from the grave clothes. And the resurrection was now in their hands. A man stopped to see his pastor the man had gone through a great personal tragedy, but came through with the help of God and his Sunday school class. He said, I was devastated, disillusioned, defeated, and immobilized. God brought me out of the tomb. My friends helped me and supported me, and together, by the grace of God, they loved me back to life. I know Creekside friends are like that too. There's a song that these seekers used to sing that goes like this. The Lord is risen to life. The Lord is risen to life. The Lord will conquer sin and death and bring us back to life. The Lord will watch over you. The Lord will smile when you laugh. The Lord will care in your moment's loss and bring you back to life. My friend, I have a gift for you, a, friend, a gift that each of you must share 
and share it well with the world about the gift it is my love my friend look in each other's eyes and if my gift isn't there then go and enter that loneliness and give to all my life we've been hearing oasis stories each Sunday during Lent Many of these are resurrection stories with multiple scenes, just like Ezekiel, who moved from crisis to hope to life. In scene one of that story, the bones were strewn across the valley, dried and broken, probably the leftovers of a bloody battle. In scene two, the bones are connected in the right order and the completed skeleton is covered with muscles and ligaments and skin. In scene three, God breathes life into these formerly dry bones, promising God's people freedom from oppressors. And so this morning we're going to have an Oasis story shared by my own husband, Carrie Kelsey.